This is one of those nights you've got to stay tuned for the hour. There is so much new information to cover. It gets complicated, but it does all fit together. And I promise, guess what? You won't get this anywhere else on TV. We start with new, explosive information in the developing scandal involving former top FBI official. His name is Peter Strzok. And according to reports from over the weekend, Strzok was removed from Mueller's investigation this summer after it was discovered that he was sending anti-Trump text messages to his girlfriend, a woman named Lisa Page. She worked as a top FBI lawyer under Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. Now, since then, Fox News has learned that the Office of Inspector General is now reviewing Peter Strzok's role in the Clinton email server investigation. And from what we know, Strzok, who is an anti-Trump, Hillary Clinton-loving FBI official, was intimately involved in investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Now, just stop for a second. Now, think about James Comey. He was writing an exoneration before an investigation. And our own Catherine Herridge is reporting that Strzok was on the ground floor of that Clinton email server investigation. This is crucial. Now, that includes participating in the July 2nd, 2016 interview of the former Secretary of State. Also remember, she was not under oath. And Strzok was involved in recommending whether or not Hillary Clinton should be prosecuted. Remember, they hadn't fully investigated. And Fox News has confirmed that the FBI official actually was the one that changed the language in James Comey's draft letter before the investigation was concluded about Hillary Clinton. The legal term, grossly negligent, he changed it to extremely careless. And the FBI agent also helped draft James Comey his now infamous exoneration statement that let Clinton off the hook. They never did the investigation. And Strzok led the probe into classified Uma Abedin emails. This guy's everywhere that were found on Anthony Weiner's computer. Now, House investigators are also telling Fox News tonight they believe that it was struck that is tied to the FBI's handling of the anti-Trump, fake news, phony Russian dossier and the FISA surveillance of a Trump campaign associate. Now, what this all means is that the fix was in on the Clinton investigation. What we have now is just more evidence, incontrovertible evidence. And speaking of the fake news dossier, Catherine Herridge is also reporting tonight that FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe is the key witness that Congress now wants to interview about that dossier. But McCabe, he's not going to show up to testify on Thursday. He is thought to have been the FBI's key point person or the handler of former British M6 agent Christopher Steele, the guy that created the phony dossier and paid Russians to lie to influence you in that election. Now, remember, according to reports, a political action committee tied to the Virginia governor, Terry McAuliffe, best friends with the Clintons. Remember, he gave a half a million dollars to Andrew McCabe's wife, Jill. She was running for her Virginia state Senate seat. Now, Virginia's Democratic Party also gave Jill McCabe over $200,000, an obscene amount, to any state Senate candidate. Now, President Trump is reacting to this new information. He's tweeting out, after years of Comey with the phony and dishonest Clinton investigation and more running the FBI, its reputation is in tatters, worse than history. But fear not, we will bring it back to greatness. The president's 100 percent right about James Comey and about Hillary Clinton and about there being a double standard for Lieutenant General, uh, General Michael Flynn. The president commented further on all of this. Let's take a look. Well, I feel badly for General Flynn. I feel very badly. He's led a very uh, strong life, and I feel very badly, John. I will say this. Uh, Hillary Clinton lied many times to the FBI. Nothing happened to her. Flynn lied, and they destroyed his life. I think it's a shame. Hillary Clinton, on the 4th of July weekend, went to the FBI, not under oath. It was the most incredible thing anyone's ever seen. She lied many times. Nothing happened to her. Flynn lied, and it's like they ruined his life. It's very unfair. Now, I know this is a ton of information to unpack here, so let me break this down even further for you. Here's what all of this means. We have an anti-Trump, pro-Hillary Clinton, top FBI official that is directly involved in letting Hillary Clinton walk free before interviewing the key people in the investigation, including Hillary Clinton. 
They exonerated Clinton before ever concluding the investigation. Then the same FBI official helped oversee special counsel Robert Mueller's probe into possible election interference. And according to Sarah Carter's reporting, interviewed Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. This guy is abusively biased. We have been saying for months that this is a political witch hunt. This new information about Peter Strzok is a smoking gun. These types of tactics, they're only used in banana republics. Now, House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes, he is now threatening to hold the FBI and the DOJ in contempt of Congress for stonewalling about why this guy struck was fired back in August. And what all of you need to know, the American people tonight, you need to know this. How deeply was this one guy, Peter Strzok, involved in Mueller's investigation? Because other than Michael Flynn... Who else did he interview? Why didn't he put Hillary under oath? And where else could Strzok have influenced and compromised this investigation with what we now know was a politically biased agenda? Remember, Lieutenant General Flynn, he was surveilled. He was unmasked. His name was leaked to the press. That is illegal. That is a crime. Nobody's been investigated or arrested. So what they did to Flynn is illegal. And we can also, we can't discount the other massive conflicts of interest, the other red flags coming from special counsel Mueller's team. For example, key members of Mueller's team, look at the money on your screen, donated tens of thousands of dollars, not to any Republicans, Democrats like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. How can anybody honestly say that those people are going to be fair and impartial after supporting liberal politicians with huge amounts of money? including President Trump's 2016 opponent. This stinks to high heaven. And there's the investigator, Andrew Weissman, another questionable member and choice by Mueller's team. Our friend and colleague Greg Jarrett did some digging into Weissman's past. Here's what he found. Back during the Enron accounting scandal, Weissman was a hard-charging prosecutor on the task force that brought a controversial obstruction of justice case against the accounting firm Arthur Anderson that eventually put that company out of business. It cost tens of thousands of people their jobs. And it was for nothing, because in 2005, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned the obstruction of justice conviction in a unanimous 9-0 ruling next to impossible. And it's not the only example of Weissman's aggressive tactics resulting in a case being overturned. The conviction of a business transaction between Enron and Merrill Lynch, it sent people to jail, was also reversed by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Critics have also accused Weissman of intimidating witnesses, creating crimes that do not even exist, and in one case in particular, withholding exculpatory evidence that would have helped the defendant. And just like Mueller, Weissman is also tied to the corrupt Uranium One deal and the ensuing cover-up. Now, Weissman ran the DOJ's fraud section during the Russian bribery scheme, and Greg Jarrett actually noticed it was his name and his signature on the bottom of the plea agreement signed by the Russian businessman involved in that case. And we can't forget that Mueller is also, what, best friends, BFF, with James Comey. A huge, massive conflict of interest and potentially even a violation of law. All of this is inexcusable in any country that cares about the rule of law. You should not be allowed to tolerate this in any way, shape, matter, or form. And we should be asking ourselves a simple question. Why, in God's name, would Robert Mueller put this abusively biased team together of unethical political crusaders who have an agenda that we can now prove. Why are they involved in this investigation? It's been one giant pattern of bias and abuse of power. And we have a tremendous amount of respect on this program for those of you that watch for law enforcement. We have a tremendous respect for the intelligence community who put their lives on the line for us every day. But because of politics, what, our Justice Department has people in it like Peter Strzok that are abusively politically biased? What is the result? We now have a two-tier justice system that I've been warning about. It is now creating a clear and present danger to this republic. If we weaponize the tools of surveillance, the powerful tools, and if we have two sets of standards for justice and people in power think they know what's in the best interest of you, the American people, and will undermine a duly elected president and try and get him thrown out of office since the day he's elected, we will have then lost this country. 
And tonight, there's another major angle to the story that we cannot ignore or discount. As the Washington Examiner's Byron York points out in a new article, the investigation into Michael Flynn was not about Russia collusion or conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia, Russia, Russia. Rather, it hinges on what's known as the Logan Act. Let me explain what this is. According to York, the and law, the Logan Act is a 218-year-old law in this country, a law that prohibits private citizens from acting on behalf of the United States in disputes with foreign governments. Guess what? In 218 years, nobody has ever been prosecuted under this law, and many legal experts call it archaic and simply irrelevant. And some even go as far to say that it's unconstitutional. But this is what played. That law played the central role in the Obama administration's investigation into Flynn. Never mind the surveillance, unmasking, and illegal leaks of intelligence. It's reportedly why the FBI agents went to the White House to interview Flynn back in January 24th about discussions that he had during the transition period with his counterpart, the Russian ambassador, about sanctions the Obama administration had placed on Russia and a U.N. resolution on Israel. Big deal. That would have been his job. This is the interview where Flynn, quote, lied to the FBI, which led to his guilty plea. Again, nothing to do with Russia. But let's take a step back for a minute. Now, during this transition period, Obama's State Department said they didn't have any problem with the Trump transition team reaching out to foreign officials. They said it. Watch this. This building doesn't see anything necessarily, uh, you know, inappropriate about contact between members of the incoming administration and foreign officials, no, no. matter what country they're from. No. Right? No. And, and again, this has been ongoing. I mean, we stand ready if they want to work through the State Department to contact some of these individuals. Um, but we have no, um, you know, no comment or no uh, uh, problem with them doing such on their own. For all of this to be based on whether General Flynn, oh, 35 year servant of his country, that he violated a 218 year old law, which no one has ever been prosecuted under, is stunning. And that's not all. Former federal prosecutor Andy McCarthy is also saying this is now an obstruction of justice investigation, and the ultimate goal is to impeach President Trump. Oh, where did you hear that before? And finally tonight, as we often say on this show, we are not the Destroy Trump media. And if you're watching at home, have no doubts about fake news not being a clear present danger to the Trump administration. They are the willing accomplices in all of this. And we have an example that should make you a believer. It's scary. It's real. And it proves what we've been saying on this program since 08. Journalism in America is dead. And on Friday morning, as news was breaking about General Flynn pleading guilty to lying to the FBI, ABC News chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross reported that Flynn was prepared to testify that it was candidate Trump that that directed him to make contact with the Russians. Here's his report. And this certainly would seem to suggest that Michael Flynn had a fair amount of information to offer the special counsel in return. That's right, George. He has promised full cooperation to the Mueller team. He's prepared to testify, we have told by a confidant, against President Trump, against members of the Trump family, and others in the White House. He is prepared to testify that President Trump, as a candidate, Donald Trump, ordered him, directed him to make contact with the Russians, which contradicts all that Donald Trump has said at this point. Hours later, Ross had to, quote, change his tune and, quote, corrected his reporting. And here's what he said on Nightly News. David, a clarification tonight on something one of Flynn's confidants told us and we reported earlier today. He said the president had asked Flynn to contact Russia during the campaign. He's now clarifying that, saying, according to Flynn, candidate Trump asked him during the campaign to find ways to repair relations with Russia and other hotspots. And then after the election, the president-elect asked him to, and told him to contact Russia on issues, including working together to fight ISIS. Hello. Big difference between candidate Trump and president-elect Trump asking Flynn to contact his soon-to-be counterparts. And according to the Washington Post on Twitter, Brian Ross initially issued a tweet promoting his fake news report about, quote, well, candidate Trump, which was retweeted 25,000 times before it was ultimately deleted. Now, this erroneous reporting, or let's call it what it is, lie, was being spread over and over again by numerous news outlets all day on Friday before Brian Ross had to walk back the story. And on Saturday, ABC News announced 
months. It's suspending Ross for four weeks without pay. By the way, a little too little, a little too late. And unfortunately for ABC, this isn't the first time Brian Ross has been accused of peddling fake news. I have a whole history of it. Like, for example, in 2012, when Ross, Ross falsely suggested the Colorado mass shooter, James Holmes, oh, he could be tied to the Tea Party. That turned out to be wrong, too. The Supreme Court handed the White House a meaningful victory today. It ruled that a travel ban affecting eight countries can go into immediate effect. That decision isn't final. Instead, it simply means the ban, which affects Iran, Sudan, Libya, Chad, North Korea, Somalia, Yemen, can remain in place while the courts evaluate whether or not it's legal. Of the nine justices, only Soda Sotomayor and Ruth Gator Gin Ruth Bader Ginsburg signaled they opposed letting the ban take effect, of course. So it's a strong sign it will be upheld when and if the court hears the actual case. Mark Stein, thankfully not covered by any of the countries listed in the travel ban. He joins us tonight. Great to see you, Mark. Hey, so, good to see you, Tucker. What uh, does but this he mean? could ban me. The he cow. could ban me. Well, because the, the president, I mean, you're right, it's a big victory. But if you take it in harness, with the last half hour. Essentially, you have had, since this administration uh, won a year ago, the permanent bureaucracy and the courts ganging up, basically, to cripple the executive branch. And the fact that uh, he had to go to court to get a temporary stay uh, in these two lower-level uh, court bans on, on his travel ban actually tells you something uh, about what an insane situation we're in. The statutory language is quite plain. Uh, the president has the authority to ban by proclamation any aliens or class of aliens. So he can ban me personally by proclamation. He can ban all Canadians by proclamation. Or he can ban classes of Canadians. He can ban Canadian tap dancers uh, because he thinks they're a threat to the American tap dancing industry. The language in the statute couldn't be plainer. And a horribly politicized judiciary, like the horribly politicized policeman you've been talking about earlier, ha has pushed language beyond its meaning in order to deny the president his most basic executive authority. So here's the trend that I'm seeing. Tell me if you see it, too. The least democratic parts of our government, which would be the courts and the bureaucracy, neither elected by voters, are getting more powerful. And the most democratic parts, the president and the Congress, are getting less powerful. So the democracy is actually withering right now. Absol absolutely. You have a permanent state. Um, uh, uh, President Obama famously said in 2009, elections have consequences. Uh, the permanent bureaucracy and the courts are saying uh, to the people, elections have no consequences. Right. You can vote for, for whatever you think you want, but we're going to ban it. Uh, we're we're, we're going to go ahead and uh, conduct business as usual. And that's, wh and that's why this court decision um, is, uh, is, is actually, the fact that it's necessary is an affront uh, to any kind of self-government uh, by the people and for the people. But what's so funny? But our elites love that. I mean, they, it's so in their Orwellian turn, they keep warning us that the election of someone they don't like is a threat to democracy. Democracy dies in darkness. But the control right. of the federal government by people who've never been elected, whose names you don't know, the, the permanent bureaucracy, that's democracy? I mean, it's literally the opposite of what's true. Yeah, and, and what's disturbing to me is uh, you, you find this attitude in Brussels, for example, uh, where, where there's a, a bunch of civil servants that seriously think they know better than yeah. the uh, peoples of 28 nations. And the whole point about the uh, U.S. system is that it was created to prevent this kind of divide uh, between the uh, governed and the people. And this, and, and actually, I think they should have gone farther, the, the Supreme Court. They, they should have, in a sense, skipped the temporary stay and just declared that this is obviously within the terms of the president's statutory authority, uh, and that if you object to it, you might as well do what Democrats and the civil service seem to want to do, uh, and that is to simply pass a constitutional amendment uh, to say that in the event, God forbid, any Republican should happen to be elected president, uh, then the entire executive branch shall just be put in the deep freeze for four years.
years and will cease to do anything whatsoever because that's yeah. what they've been trying to do since last November. And that's basically what's happened, unfortunately. Mark Stein, thank you. That's a deep analysis. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Tucker.